Hey, everybody. It is Eric Green from Tax Rep Network. Thank you all for listening again uh, to this, uh, this week's uh, podcast. I want to tell you, we only ever have products that we pitch that we actually use. Okay, so basically, we've used these two products, and then I went to the companies and said, hey, we love your product. Um, again, the two products that we use, Call ENQ and Tax Help Software. What Call ENQ does is you dial up, you will get through to the IRS in under three minutes, and most often in 30, uh, under 30 seconds. You will get right through. You will save, and I'm not kidding you, uh, at our firm, we believe we're going to save at least $50,000 of billable time by not sitting on the phone, waiting, uh, waiting for someone at the IRS to pick up, getting the quote-unquote courtesy hang-up, that is actually what they call it, where you call up and at the end of the day, they just simply hang up on you or they tell you their system is down. It is unbelievable. It's an unbelievable product. We use it at the firm. I highly recommend you do too. There is a link below out to call ENQ with a TRN for Tax Rep Network discount code. What will happen is you will get 200 minutes just for our members, our listeners, 200 minutes for $19.95. Okay, trust me when I tell you, you're going to be charging your client, right? $350, $500, $750, whatever you're going to charge to call up and get the first-time penalty abatement. Pull the transcripts. Get a hold on collection. Whatever it is you're trying to do, instead of waiting 40 minutes, an hour, hour and a half to maybe or maybe not get through, just like that, 30 seconds, certainly under three minutes, you get in, you get it done. This is how you make money doing representation work. So go check out Call ENQ. Same thing, transcript delivery, need to resolve the tax debt. The only software we use, tax help software. We pull our transcripts, we can do our offers, everything is done right in the software. Okay, and we have the special discounts that we've arranged with Roger, the, one of the founders of tax help software. Uh, check on those links below, go check this out. You can get a free two week trial or get 10% off, and I, I assure you, it is the only software we use when it comes to tax resolution, all right? So thank you all for listening in. Go check out our sponsors, and I hope you enjoy this week's podcast. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us on uh, this week's podcast on Tax Rep Network. I'm Eric Green. I'm very excited about my guest uh, this week, um, who's not only a friend but a mentor, uh, Claudia Hill. Uh, most of you probably know who Claudia is, but if you don't, uh, Claudia is an enrolled agent. Uh, she's a nationally recognized tax professional and frequent lecturer on taxation of individuals, tax planning, representation before the IRS. She's the editor-in-chief of uh, Walters Kluwer uh, Journal of Tax Practice and Procedure, you know, formerly CCH. Uh, she's a co-author of CCH's expert treatise, Tax Practice and Procedure, and is a frequent presenter at associations, industry seminars, uh, including the IRS Nationwide Tax Forums, AICPA's Engage Conference in Las Vegas, the NAEA National Tax Practice Institute, Spidel Seminars, numerous university-sponsored tax controversy programs, and CCH online seminars. Claudia has testified before both the Senate Finance Committee and House Ways and Means Committee. She's often called upon by the media for comments about tax issues. She's an NAEA National Tax Practice Institute Fellow and a multi-level instructor of it at NTPI. Claudia is an associate member of the American Bar Association Tax Section. In 2011, Claudia was selected as one of the top 10 people in tax by tax analysts. Uh, Claudia is the owner and principal of Tax Ma'am Inc. and TMI Tax Services Group Inc. And she, we were just talking about, continues to maintain an active tax planning preparation and representation practice in Cupertino, California. Claudia, thank you for doing this. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, and I cut this down just so we could get through it. Um, <laughs> and listen, I got to tell you, I want to dispense with this right out of the gate. And for those of you listening, because I get this a lot um, from both tax rep members, but also people that are just interested in it. The, 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 uh, the idea that, you know, Eric, I, I got this case and it now has an extra zero in front of it. So I, th I really think we need to get a lawyer. Uh, and I'm always telling people, no, why? What is the zero? What is that? 
folks, the woman I'm about to speak to is an example of why you do not need a lawyer. There, if you know what you're doing, and Claudia certainly does, she is as expert at this as I am, probably better, all right? And she is not an attorney. Um, she is somebody I call not only when I just want to complain, I have <laughs> problems I, I need to bounce off of. Um, and so, Claudia, I actually... Um, appreciate you at many levels, um, aside from the fact that you're helping me become a columnist, to the advice you give me, to just listening <laughs> to me <laughs> complain. Um, uh, no, I really appreciate it. I have many rabbis in my life. Um, Chuck Reddick, who is now our commissioner, being one. Brian Scarlatos, um, you know, um, L.G. Brooks. You, I, I, Sid Kess, I mean, there are some of the giants in our field, and I, I appreciate mm -hmm. everything you do. Um, thank you. And, and, and really, thank you for doing this. Uh, and so what, what I was hoping we could talk about today, um, you know, we're about to embark on another tax season. In fact, we're recording this on the 28th. It'll be posted uh, over the next several days at some point. Um, but of course, the IRS is now accepting returns starting today. So we're about to embark on another tax season. And you and I have discussed at, at multiple meetings all of the screwy things that happen during tax season that shouldn't, um, and, and the sort of critical mistakes people make. And uh, I thought that this would be an opportunity for us to just kind of go through those. And I can get you to comment uh, on them. Uh, so hopefully the people listening to this know, don't do that, <laughs> or things that they should be doing but are not. Um, you know, and, and for us, at least, you know, Claudia, do you agree? A lot of the stuff we do in representation, all of that's meant much of it stems from things that were done or not done during tax season. Right, right. We, uh, we have to have our head centered when we're preparing returns, if you are a return preparer, with doing proactive efforts while you prepare the returns so that you can protect that return going forward. Uh, I won't re let a return out of my office that I don't feel like I can justify what's on that return later. So if it doesn't make sense to me at one point, I stop the, stop the game early. I don't want the, the backlash that happens when you don't uh, prospectively look at what's going on. But you know, a lot of the, it, it starts with good practices within your firm, not just right. talking to the clients, but before you even have a client sit down with you. Swing out and thinking through the entire engagement. Oh, and, and we're gonna and we're gonna go there. But what? Uh, by the way, if you're listening, and, and you, you and I have seen this, when something does go wrong, oh. the client, the first thing the client's gonna do, they're gonna throw you under the bus. Exactly. I I, I, I gave that to you. Oh, why didn't you catch this? Um, you know, I, it, it happens constantly. And if they don't think of it, if it's a criminal case, they're going to have a defense counsel suggesting to them yes. how they can blame the preparer. Yes. That's um, one thing about the relationship with attorneys, if you're a non-attorney. And the attorney's job is, is to protect that client. Well, you're the one that prepared the return that the client's now in a mess with. And so it's not that the attorney doesn't like you or doesn't <laughs> – they may have no – ill feelings towards you at all, but they've got to find a target to deflect in the effort to protect that client. And you're an easy target if you sign that tax return. No, ab absolutely. And, um, uh, and your, your records are actually going to potentially become an issue. But, you know, again, we'll get into that. But the, the very first thing you, you actually mentioned, engagement letters. Yes. Um, so many, uh, for some reason, and, and you know what, I, I think what happens, and, and you know, actually, you know what, I, I'm not going to say what I think, I'll let you, I'll hear what you think, okay. but, but the issue of engagement letters um, for, t for practitioners. Well, you know, people re think about if I do a representation engagement, collection, examination, I want to make sure that I understand what I'm doing and what the, what's expected of the client. So it, very few people would go into a, a formal uh, arrangement with a client to represent them without having one. But everything starts at the beginning of the tax return preparation process. And just to give an idea of some of the things that, um, that I think need to be clarified in the engagement letter is not only that I have agreed to prepare the return, but I have expectations of the client. I mean, I expect the client to provide me timely 
the information I need, not drop it off. If they come in in February 1st, I don't expect them to drop it off April 14th and think they're going to get a finished return. Um, I want to, them to know I have expectations that they will also review that tax return and that they will be forthcoming when it comes to disclosing all of their income. You know, yep. you, don't, you don't want to find out later that they told you just what they wanted to tell you. And then they're still blaming you for not getting it on the return. Um, and, and I know a lot of practitioners will say, well, my clients won't fill, fill out the organizer. Well, did you have an engagement agreement that said what you expected of them first? That's the first step. And then being forceful about telling them what you need. But some of the things that, that in the last few years that we've included and added to our organizer that hadn't been there a decade ago was that a, a, a affirmative statement related to the number of state returns we're going to do. There's been a whole lot of emphasis in the last several years, and I think it's because the states are hungrier, uh, in multi-state sourcing. And so you need to make sure that whenever you quote a fee, that, that you're saying this fee covers your resident state. If there are other states, there will be additional fees to do that. And, and I have clients that make investments in partnerships, and those partnerships can have two-digit numbers for income or two-digit numbers for withholding. Well, Will I prepare a return in every instance where you touch that state? Or will I get back to you and say, do you want me to prepare it? Because there's a judgment call. I'm not going to charge them 20 bucks to prepare a non-resident return for a state. It's going to take time. Yep. So understanding the expectations becomes real important. Um, often my basic tax preparation fee does not cover an F-bar. That's a separate a fee that goes on to it. Um, a lot of my clients will come in and say, oh, can you just take care of my kids too? Well, I'm not going to do the kids for free. Yep. So I want them to know that if they want me to do the children's return, there's an additional fee that will go with the children's return. Um, I also have had clients say, wow, this fee is pretty high. Does it cover any audits that come later? In my case, it does not. Okay. Any work that's done after the fact, I charge based on my time that's involved into it. I know there are some practitioners out there who beat themselves up doing the follow-up that wasn't their fault. I mean, it wasn't their fault the IRS decided to send a notice on that a return, and they're doing the work for free. So be real clear in your engagement letter that it covers the preparation of the return. Anything after that is a separate engagement. Well, yeah, and what, one of the things I find fascinating, and, and – uh, a lot of the problems really do stem, from my, from my perspective, the fact that taxpayers don't truly understand, one, the value of, of their, their EA or CPA, and don't know how to properly use them. Uh, if they are bringing everything to you in March, there's some planning you can do, but not much. No, you know, and, you know, and, I, and I've always been urging people, they need business owners. When I do speak in front of non-practitioner groups, you've got to be talking to your accountant at least quarterly, preferably monthly. What, what is amazing is, you know, some of us get into habits that we find hard to break. When I was building my practice in the first place to try to attract the kind of clients who did appreciate what I did, I wouldn't take on a new client unless they agreed to see me before the beginning of filing season so I could get that account set up. But, but also because year-end tax planning expanded the times the client would call and having the clients come in and do year-end tax planning, they could see that we could save money. You know, and I could generally justify, more than justify my fees by them coming in for one hour and me helping them do the year-end planning. And they knew then what to plan for, for whether they're going to have a balance due or refund coming. Uh, they could, we could modify that fourth quarter estimate. But I think in incorporating that early on in my practice made a huge difference in terms of teaching the client's respect. To me, preparing the tax return is a technical function. You have to be a good technician. But you don't necessarily have to be someone who can say, had you done this differently, this is what you would have saved. So in those early years when I was building and I was trying to teach clients the value of this, I would explain to them as we'd go through, well, my goodness, had you done this, for example, had you done a Roth conversion, we wouldn't have a negative income. Or if you would have told me you were doing this and this, here's what we could have done. And it... <laughs> It builds value. Your clients don't know what you're worth unless you tell them. 
many of us make our jobs look super easy. I remember ages ago uh, attending a session with a, a gentleman who was starting his practice, and one of the techniques he used was to organize, make, make order out of chaos with the client's documents, yeah. and he would comment on, yes, I need all of these pieces. Here's what I can get from them. And the clients then started respecting that he was doing more than putting a few numbers in a few boxes. You don't right. want, it's not putting a few numbers in a few boxes. It's knowing what numbers to put in which boxes in order to get the outcome and, and make sure you're covering everything that you possibly can for your client. You know, and well, th that's the big frustration is clients like, well, you're, you're just putting stuff in the, in the, in the software. Yeah, no, I have to tell you the truth. So, well, we're now seeing uh, my, my podcast last week, Claudia, was literally why your 1040 practice is fucked and what to do about it. Um, <laughs> and so, but, but what, what, one of the things I commented on is, you know, 48% of people officially filed their own returns in, six, in uh, 17. All right. If you were to pull away all of the people that are at the big international and, and regional firms, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, the hedge fund owners we have, we have a lot of hedge fund people that live here in Connecticut, in, in downstate. Um, they're not going to tell Ernst & Young, for example, I know you did my hedge fund, I know you did our holding companies, and I know you did the real estate partnerships. Give me the K-1s, I'll go home on TurboTax and do it myself. They're not going to, uh, right? Yeah, no, right? The, the entities, they, you know, those, but, it's, but if you took those people out of the equation, it's not really 48%, it's up closer to 58%. Now with the increased standard deduction, more people are gonna say, well, I can do it myself, all right? Do you know that the IRS expects, the White House Council of Economic Advisors yep. believes that the number of people who will itemize their returns is gonna to drop to less than 8%. For oh, no. years, the Schedule A has been the bread and butter. That's what's pumped up the fee for many people who prepare tax returns. As we kiss that goodbye, are we also gonna be kissing our fees goodbye? Oh, I mean, you've gotta think through this about what, where it's going. Well, so I, I, I have been plugging, of course, for me, it's representation, right? So yeah. I don't, if you're an EA or a CPA, why you are at least are not doing some IRS representation is beyond me. But even, let's say you say, you know, I don't like the IRS, or, you know, I like accounting. Why don't you go get your CFE? Start doing more forensic work. I got news for you. There aren't enough of them. And, right. we, and, and uh, I mean, you and I are friends with Walter. Um, mm -hmm. Walter, who's been one of the preeminent people in the country, seven fifty an hour. And, and we, we don't even bat an eye when we, when we bring him in because we need him. All right. What about becoming a certified financial planner? There are ethics yep. rules we got to look at if you're going to also be doing tax prep. Uh, I, the, my argument, and I had Dominique Molina as, a, as a, um, uh, an interviewee a couple months ago, uh, her pit plug was the same thing. It's time to elevate your practice. You can, you, you can be a good practice. You can still continue to be a, tech, a tax practitioner, but you've got to elevate yourself above, and I won't name them, but those, um, those chain preparation places that are on every corner. Those places, I don't know how they're going to stay in business. Um, we've got to, I think people have got to elevate their game, but, um, you know, I don't want to get too far afield, but it, it really is, um, there are going to be challenging times and this isn't an opportunity. Every risk is also an opportunity. Every disruption is an opportunity. And I, I think the opportunity here is you got to differentiate yourself. There are going to be a whole lot of people who are going to be looking for a different career. I think within the next two years as the 1040 business, when the schedule A's are gone, begins to dry up. The other thing is there'll be more representation. Do you know how many clients come in here who are being audited or in collection because they were audited from the turbo tax return they tried to do themselves and botched it? Yeah. The thing, you know, I had two partnerships and well, it asked me how many miles did you drive this year? So I put down 20,000 miles and the next one, how many miles? Oh, 20,000. I keep putting in 20,000. So of course <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I drove hundred thousand miles this year. Didn't you, um, <laughs> you know, and so they get audited and now that, that, you know, they didn't owe very much. Now they owe a ton. They get hit with the accuracy penalty, the interest, and it's normally at least two years, maybe three. And they end up becoming, you know, our clients.
Um, anyway, um, so no, the, the retainer agreements is a big deal. The other thing I hear constantly is, well, I, you know, I call the accountant when we're there now and now they're in trouble. I call the accountant and the accountant say, well, the client understood that. I assume that oh. you know, when I explained it, oh, them, they my goodness. Knew. Yeah, you know, one of the things that is just amazing is making any assumptions that your client understands what you're saying to them. I mean, that's, that sounds odd, but any assumption we make about what the client understands is, is a high probability of being wrong. I, I have worked with people for years and years and years, and I thought they were on the same link that they understood what I was telling them. And then all of a sudden, I see something unwind, and I realize they didn't. I mean, one of the biggest ones that amazes me is I do a lot of estate and trust work. Yep. I was explaining to one client who, who had not done a uh, separate property trust. He was a single individual, and he needed a trust. He said he wasn't feeling well. He was concerned about his health. And he says, isn't there anything else I can do uh, besides having a trust to avoid probate? And I said, well, you can have a designated beneficiary. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, it's where you name who you want it to go to. Okay. So this, this gentleman, without me knowing it, um, he thought he understood what I was telling him, but not all kinds of assets have designated beneficiaries that work. He went home. He died uh, six weeks later after this conversation at only 62. But what he had done is he went home that day and he started changing the designation on his accounts to my estate. You know what that does? It guarantees probate. <laughs> oh, what an ordeal. And then I ended up handling it for him. <laughs> so, 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 so making an assumption that the client knows what you're doing. That's why in my engagement letter, we also put a thing. If I have questions, I will ask those questions because we say certain types of deductions require certain types of validation and retention of certain documents. And I want the clients to know this. They can't sit here and pick numbers off the ceiling. You know, they can't use numbers with a lot of zeros at the end in my office. This doesn't work. I will, I will take an organizer that's incomplete, and if I come to something that the client's sitting here muttering and saying, use what we did last year, I smile at them and say, you know, I'm afraid we're going to miss deductions if we do this. Why don't you take this organizer back and work on it and then give it back to me, and I'll, I'll work from that. Because yep. the, the clients need to take responsibility. They want to abdicate their responsibility for their own return. I had a client walk in my office one day and say, I got this letter from IRS. And he was talking to my office manager. And he says, and I figured if she couldn't see the problem, they couldn't either. <laughs> and this is what my secretary was telling me that he said that. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know. So pull out that engagement letter when I next have him come in. And I explain to him what happened. And I says, but if you knew about it, why didn't you tell me? And, and he says, because I figured your name would be on the bottom line on that return. And I said, yeah, but yours is, and you're the responsible person. It was, it was back in the days that, that the W-2s came with carbon papers, and sometimes sixes look like eights. And yep. uh, So the quality of the documents you look at, and you really need to look at them. You, you grill the client, make sure that they know. There's a lot of pushback. It's subtle that goes on when we work with clients, but we let them know that they're the responsible party. And we will prepare a defendable return on their behalf because nobody wants to owe money and nobody wants to make mistakes or to find out they've made a mistake. But the best way to do that is to be proactive as you're working with the client and, and let them help you to do the kind of best job you can. Yeah, no. And uh, uh, the other thing is a lot of this does cut two ways. I mean, there's always, you know, from my perspective, the criminal aspect, you know, because uh, they forgot to tell you something or, or they made something up. But, you know, we had we had a preparer here who went to prison who was like just falsifying stuff on returns. And the reality is. I know because I ended up having to defend some of these people late, you know, later on, because what the IRS what CI did is they prosecuted the preparer and then sent everyone letters just disallowing everything. Um, some of these people had been getting cheated. They're, they actually had more deductions. He just never wanted to be bothered. He just, he just made stuff up as he went along and what he made up wasn't high enough. Um, you know, and that's, that's another error that I see people do is they don't force the client to provide the information. There, there are a number of practitioners out there who are, promoting a form of practice where you don't have to talk to the client, 
the client just either drops the stuff off or uploads it to a, a an online mailbox kind of thing, or it goes online and t keys it in themselves and they just import it into the return. My goodness, you're going to put your signature on something that you, when you've never even talked to the client and you haven't gone through a list of questions to make sure that you're doing your best job for them. That, that amazes me. So oh, yeah. you distinguish yourself and then you'll have so many clients coming to you. It'll be hard to handle it. Yeah, no. The other thing though, I want to, you know, uh, you'll love this because I get this. Eric, can you just handle this? You know, you know, they want to do an offer and compromise. It's not a lot of money. It should be simple. Oh yeah. Yes. It, 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 first of all, the one, and, and if you're listening, I want you, this is what I'd like you to take away from this in the, in the offer or in the representation world, there's no such thing as simple yes. Yes. Number one. And number two, it's the same process, whether they owe 10,000 or 10 million, the offer process is exactly the same. The work is exactly the same. And in many ways, Claudia, I'd love your take on this. The work is probably worse for the 10,000 because one, yes. this person, that's like their whole life. And number two, they're, they're generally not as sophisticated. So I find the handholding mm -hmm. worse on the smaller cases than on the bigger ones. And, and if you do it right and consistently on those offers for your moderate income people, you have a higher probability of a success than you do with someone coming with a huge liability, but you got to dot the I's, cross the T's. Procedurally, you go through the same steps, but you're right. When you're working with a client and, and that IRS liability is weighing heavy on their life, on their ability to pay bills, to take care of their kids, that's, that's real. And that's emotional and that's heavy work you're doing. And they will literally call you three times a day like one of them is now. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, especially with the IRS shutdown recently. Oh, my goodness. They didn't turn off the uh, automatic letters in the sequence yep. that they go out. And so the clients are keep getting letters and they're calling and saying, what about this penalty? What about this? And, and, and the frustration as a practitioner trying to deal with them when you can't fax anything in. It's ugh, crazy maker stuff. But Oh, yeah. That's what no, we've chosen. No, it, it, it is nuts. Um, uh, something else. And again, you touched on this already, fees. Yes. You know, these, um, you know, the practitioners who I talk to, and like you said, you know, the FBAR is a separate, it's a separate return, technically. Yeah. And right? it doesn't the, go to IRS, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and the representation is not included. Um, this is something I've had to break some of my members of who thought that, well, I'm doing their 1040. Isn't that included? I'm like, no. I'm like, unless you're the one advising them not to pay their taxes, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, how you come to the conclusion that, that that's included in the $350 or $450 you're charging for a 1040, which by the way is not enough. Um, you know, I mean, again, you touched on this, but your experience with fees and how you deal with it. Well, you know, I believe telling the client up front, this is my base fee. And for years I adopted that. And as I gained added new practitioners, my base fee went up. Currently my base fee to see me to do a 1040 is $980. I don't do many returns at that level. They often cost a lot more than that. But I have other people on the staff who have other base fees. And we don't do well, what used to be a 1040A type of returns. We do returns that the kind of client that you work with attracts similar clients. So as you start upgrading your practice and you start working more with professionals, then you will get more and more of the complex returns that the professionals are likely to have. And so a return that has a lot of other ingredients in it starts becoming more valuable to the client. I have not done this because I live in Silicon Valley and everybody's income, it seems, is inflated. But I remember some pricing models years ago, it took the presumption that the higher a person's income, the higher probability of audit. Now, if you read IRS statistics, that may not be the case, but the higher probability of complexity, I would say, on those. And so the fees were set higher for higher income people. I would have trouble with that kind of a, a fee schedule, but think about your fee schedule this coming year when you start seeing a lot of the pieces totally change in terms of the presentation of the client. If you see the drop in the schedule A, the number of ones you're doing and a reminder to you, when you've had a major tax law, you get people coming 
to have their return prepared who may not have uh, used a preparer the prior year. The reason they do that is they think, well, the law changed. I want to get an example of what the new return is going to look like. And they don't intend to come back next year because they will do the return that you prepared and they will compare it to a TurboTax return the next year. Okay, so, so you have the opportunity with those people who are coming out for the first time or for the first time in several years this year to have the return prepared to show them that you do more than just put a few numbers in boxes. But unless you tell them what you're doing, they won't know that. Here's an excellent example. We have this year 200%, not 200, 100% bonus depreciation. And a lot of people don't realize it, but that bonus depreciation on new access is an assumption that you will do the 100% bonus out the value of that that asset now that can be too big for the return to handle it can cause an aberration in what the schedule c would look like okay? but the key on this is that your software is going to assume that you want to take that bonus you can't go on autopilot you have to make an informed decision as to whether this is in the best interest of your client you may want to not take bonus depreciation I don't think an individual trying to do it themselves would even be able to have that kind of thought process themselves as they go through it. They would just let the software do what it's supposed to do. Um, and it doesn't do what it wants to do, what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to get the best out from the client. It, it doesn't get that best outcome unless it's got guidance. You are the guidance. And so you ask the client questions that will help you get to the optimum amount of tax not just simply put the numbers in the boxes. Don't go on autopilot, especially this filing season. It would be yeah. tough to do it. Yeah. No, and I have to tell you what's interesting is the National Society of Accountants who, that report annually what the average price of a 1040 is in America. Mm -hmm. In 2012, it was $335. In 2014, it had dropped to 289. Uh, in 2016, 261. It is actually Why? falling. Why? Well, a couple things. One is I do believe that the message that has gone out um, from the, again, I won't name them, those national prep companies is it's a commodity. Yeah. And you've got, you know, I don't even think it's called TurboTax anymore, whatever it is. You know, they do it yourself at home, do it online for free. Um, yeah. That, that, that people have this sense that it's simply a commodity, right? And they can go and get, you know, anything, you know, get it in why, why would you pay a lot of money for it? And, and again, it stems from not appreciating when you have someone who's knowledgeable um, and, and, you know, they're paying for you not because you're sticking it in the computer. It's the knowledge that you have. I want Claudia Hill to do my return because I know Claudia is on top of this. I, I want Walter on my forensic case because I know he knows what he's doing and the government respects him. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, if I just need someone, you know, if I'm just looking for a slapdash, you know, I can grab any bookkeeper to do that, they, they, there's an expertise and I think people just don't appreciate it. So they're, they've become price sensitive in an area that they really shouldn't be. Um, I, I cannot underscore the value added that your client gets when you talk to the client. When you, if, if they are a wage earner, you should be talking to them about, I see you put $3,000 in your 401k this year. Had you put $4,000 in it, this is how much more it would have saved you. This three saved you this much. I got into a habit of doing this for clients years ago, telling them, let's see what kind of benefits your employer offers. Are you using your dependent care benefits? That 5,000 can save you another thousand dollars over you trying to take the childcare credit. So there's, there's so much value that you can provide just by telling them what you might considered to be obvious things, but the average person does not think of those average things. Uh, the ability to accumulate money into a Roth IRA, oh my goodness, over a person's lifetime, huge benefit with that. I sometimes start people with the Roth IRA and tell them, you can use this to buy your first home, you know, yep. because you pull principal out first on these things after five years. So there's so much you can offer the client and that's where you build the value and that's how you build your fees. Right. No, no. And now 
How do you deal with the issue of people who don't pay their fees? Well, they're not clients, Eric. <laughs> that, that, they, that's true. Exactly. Listen, listen I, I I'm have, all about retainers. Yeah, yes. Mr. Green well, won't do nothing until Mr. Green shows up in my office. I had a client uh, in December called the he was he's a young person he was he's a family member of one of my wealthier clients and he's now out on his own supposedly so he calls and books an appointment we have an hour conversation i send him a bill for the time okay he sends me back an email and says i just got a bill from you uh if i have to pay this i'm not a client and i says you're right because people who don't pay my bills aren't clients i said you you took all i have to sell is my time okay that's the only thing i'm selling is my time and you took my time, and, and I believe we provide, yes, and provided you uh, some recommendations for going forward. And if you don't pay the fee, that's up to you, but you won't be a client going forward. Oh, yeah, no. And um, we also don't sue clients in small claims. It's just, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Have you seen anything I have, Eric, where people do a counter sue and suit and say, well, she didn't get the return done on time and it caused me IRS penalties or, or this and that. And the judge turns around and files a claim against the preparer. I saw, that, that I have not seen. <laughs> yeah. I saw a practitioner walk out of a claims suit, a uh, small claims suit sort with a judgment against her. Because uh, bottom line, people do not understand tax. Judges in these things do not understand tax. Right. So, Big yeah, no, strike against you. I, I will tell you this. I've, I've had this where um, client came in and what I do is I'll charge for a consult. And um, if it's only going to be a consult for an hour, I'm 475. But if you want me to pull transcripts and have a conversation with you in advance, I charge um, 750. And so 750, we get the transcripts, person comes in, we go through it. They, they've been spending t tens of thousands of dollars trying offers. Yeah. They can't, they can't, they can't do an offer. All right. They have way too much equity, way too much assets. Um, and the revenue officer who has this case is lost patience. And she basically said, if you don't pay me by Friday, I'm sh 5 PM. I'm, sh I'm going to, I'm going to ha drop the hammer and we're, we're going to put you out of business. Um, oh. I said, listen, you've got all the money sitting there, pull it out of this savings, pull it out of here, pay the thing off. And you know, um, the, um, they said, okay, you know, but, but the revenue officer, she's so mean, she's a friend of mine. I call her up while they're there, say, look, I just met with them. We, I've explained everything. They're going to borrow the money. Can they get another week? But they're not going to, no more offers, no more any of that. They're going to pay the whole thing off and be done. She's like, Eric, that's all I wanted. No problem. You got a week. They walk out there happy. Well, maybe not terribly happy, but you know, they're <laughs> relieved and we're all done. Um, a month and a half later, they called me up and said, we want, we want the money back, the 750. I said, why? Why? Yeah. And um, this person was an insurance adjuster. That's what he did. And uh, he, uh, he uh, says, well, you didn't do anything. Oh, I, I, said, I, said, what, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you didn't really do anything. And, and I said, I said, and I'll, I'll, I'll make up a name. I'll, let's call him Joe. I said, Joe, um, you're an insurance adjuster, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, you don't do anything. He said, what, what do you mean? I said, if my, I have a fire at my house, right? So I call you, right? And he said, yeah. I'm like, you don't do anything. You're not going to grab a hammer and get up on the, on the roof and get to work. You don't do anything. He said, well, no. I said, I understand insurance. I said, you have expertise in other words. He said, yeah. I said, so do I. I said, if you, you, how much money did you spend on offers that, that had no chance of going anywhere? 30,000. And uh, I said, listen, I I'm sorry, but this is what you paid for. Um, but no, I am. Um, same thing. We, we don't suit. We don't chase people into small claims court. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not worth it. But um, again, people don't uh, don't understand uh, the value of our time. Um, you know, there's a couple areas um, as we go into filing season that to keep the client from having worse problems later, practitioners need to understand about dealing with IRS because you can prepare a return sometimes and know that someone's going to get themselves in a jam that they owe money. And, you know, this year in particular, it's going to be difficult because IRS changed the withholding charts and huge numbers of people, wage earners primarily, families are with two workers are going to find that they owe money and they haven't owed money for, before. 
yep. at least for many years. So this year in particular, make sure that you have your head on straight in being able to advise the clients when you find out there's a balance due on those returns. Because you and I, having worked in the representation area, you know it goes on autopilot for IRS when there's a balance due. Yep. So, so tell the client in advance, this is what's going to happen. I can give you an example. You can set up an installment agreement through the return that you file, okay? But doing so will speed up the collection process. And if you have a client who's telling you, well, I normally get my bonus in June, I can probably pay the balance I owe them, but not until June, then you can look at some alternatives, can't you? You can put the return on extension. You're going to have under failure to pay penalties, but you won't have failure to file. So you explain to the clients the difference between the failure to pay, failure to file. You can uh, file the return and get a 120-day delay on getting the balance due paid and help the client again that way. So being proactive and look at, looking at these things in advance, uh, making sure that when you see a client who's shocked because they haven't owed money in several years and they owe it this year, deal with it up front. Let them know you do more than return preparation, that you understand how the IRS system works. Yep. You will guide them through that process if they aren't able to pay immediately. Or, yeah, and, and in fact, I was going to tell you, I, I just gave a webinar where I talked about this, where if you do a, and it's normally not one, just one, although it could be one return, but it could be a multiple, multiple returns. You know, a Paul Mamo had told me they've identified 7 million non-filers. So 2019, they expect to be the year to go and start going after the non-filers um, that they've identified. You know, you may, it's very possible. You can have clients coming in who need two, three, four, five years of returns done, and they're not going to be able to pay. And so, Along the vein of where you were going with this, Claudia, is a couple of things. You know, I'll get these calls from the accountant say, you know, Eric, we got them into compliance. I filed all the federal returns. Okay, did you do it? What about the state? We'll get to those next. That's a critical error, but we'll get there. The other thing is married filing joint. Yes. Why? Practitioners have learned the hard way, Eric. I've seen uh, attorneys suggest to the a client who's in a collection mess because they filed a joint return or who prepared this return? Did that preparer tell you you had a choice? And then they turn around and go after the preparer and say, you should not have filed this as a joint return. It would have kept this person, the, the spouse that wasn't earning the income. It would have kept them from having any of this liability. And now you've cost them all this money plus our fees. And they will fly, file an E&O claim against the practitioner for not giving that piece of advice. Oh, yeah, no. So, um, with, you know, when, when it comes to collection, Claudia, you know there's that line for delinquent state taxes? Mm -hmm. You yep. get 100% of what you're paying only if the state is out ahead of the feds. And because yeah. of 6321, which basically says a lien arises upon demand for payment retroactive back to the date of assessment, the IRS position is they're in first place if you if you e-file simultaneously. But I have told practitioners, one is the whole married filing joint, married filing separate. You have to go through the collection RCP analysis and then talk to the couple. And it, you have to have the couple there. I, I, yeah. I get the... I get, I get um, bent out of shape when the husband says, can I just deal with this? No, you can't. Yeah. Um, in yeah. fact, that's probably why you got into trouble in the first place. Um, but the idea of, are we better off married filing separate? Because if it's a big enough balance and we're not going to pay it anyway, can we keep the, the innocent spouse out of it? Uh, and number two, what if with the non-filer, what if we mailed the state returns first? Because California, I know, is very aggressive, oh, awful, but they, they could learn something from Connecticut. Connecticut is nasty. <laughs> Connecticut, I've had Connecticut, and I'm not kidding, I've had collection people here in Connecticut make the following statements. A, now Connecticut as a public policy does not seize people's homes. We've never done it Good. in the entire history. They won't do it. Uh, now that may change someday, but they're not, they won't do it. But I've had collection people say, yeah, we're going to come take the house. I'll be there Friday. Knowing full well legally they can't do it. But, but more what I do get is this. Um, we need to get paid. I understand, but the IRS is ahead of you. Their lien's ahead of you. There is no money left over. We don't give a shit about them. And I'm like, well, there's the UCC, which puts their lien ahead of you. And I've actually had them tell me, we don't care about the UCC. 
So now with that as backdrop, knowing that I'm going to have Connecticut, um, New York is a little bit better, but Connecticut, we're paying Connecticut one way or another. Here's the other thing though. Connecticut does not have a 10 year statute and we charge 1% a month, like, like a credit card statutory. It cannot be Mm -hmm. abated. It's actually in the statute that it can't be abated. So, um, knowing that Connecticut is a going to get paid no matter what and B we want to pay because it'll never go away and it's going to balloon otherwise. Why don't we get the state returns in first? I can set my payment plan up with the state very aggressively because I want to get 1% a month. I want to get that paid off quickly. Just makes financial sense. But now I can set them up at a number where I can zero the RCP on the federal and use the state as leverage to get rid of the IRS. I can't do any of that or consider it if we're just going to knee jerk, married filing joint, submit the returns, and then we'll just have a lawyer deal with the fallout. Because it, I've had clients, we won't do this, but I have had clients, Claudia, say exactly what you said, which is, should I sue my accountant? Yep. And I'm going to say, look, we, we, don't, we don't do that kind of work. I mean, we could. I mean, Jeff, I mean, we have, we have five litigators here as a practice point. We don't sue accountants. We don't sue lawyers. Um, you know, sure. but, um, but, I, but I can tell you, I've had clients go out to find people to sue, cl- sue accountants and sue lawyers. Yeah. Um, so no, um, other thing that just makes me nuts is, uh, and, and again, I, I know that nobody wants to do this, right? It's, it's April 10th, 11 o'clock at night. Nobody wants to start auditing the client. Could you look at the sales tax returns? So many of the clients do the sales tax returns themselves. What triggers an audit, usually on the state side, it doesn't match the federal. Ah, uh, yep. And so the state, yes. the state says, we got your federal gross schedule C gross receipts, says 2 million. Your sales tax returns say 1.2. So either A, show us the returns for the other states you're selling in, all right? But there should have been a deduction on page two for that, right? You have the gross oh. number should be the same, and then you deduct out of state sales or here's your bill Jeez. um you know and it's not your job you know you're not doing the sales tax returns but i wish practitioners would at least, at least get look copies at of them yes look yeah. at them and say wait a minute you're you're why are we so off um that's why the practitioner really has to have something in their file i've i've represented practitioners who when irs has come in after them giving them penalties for aiding and abetting or for lack of diligence in, in preparing the returns and tried to shut them down basically by by putting so many of their penalty potentials in front of them but the the issue that it comes down to is they didn't gather the tools to protect themselves so that's why i insist that even if the client says i don't want to use an organizer but then they give me something else in their writing that shows what they've done and when you know you've got multiple multiple state agencies looking at attributes of the return my goodness, it would only make sense to say, I can't prepare your Schedule C or your uh, partnership or your S-Corp return until I see the other returns that you've filed if your office isn't doing them. You've got right. to have consistency on that kind of stuff. You've got to protect yourself. You, yeah. And having what the client gave you and validating it becomes extremely important. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, some other stuff. We are not obligated under Circular 230 to audit our clients. But if you're a practitioner and you've done a return and all of the expense numbers are nice, even round numbers. <laughs> What's wrong with the picture? Yeah. I think that you have now enough for that where you are required to make additional inquiry. Yep. Because I've had this. I look at the return. I, I tell the, I, 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 so I call the accountant and say, well, Where's the backup on these? Well, he gave me one of those green, old green sheets where he wrote down his income and expenses, which means this, this was handed to the accountant. And I'm like, didn't you notice the nice rounded numbers? And this is what they, literally they, they will say to me, well, it's probably wrong, but he's the one, he's the one giving it to me. It's his problem. I'm like, no, it, no. it's not. It, it is yours um, because you're now at best, negligent but at worst f- potentially f- knowingly filing a false return or a return that you have reason to believe may be false yeah. um no it, it it gets a little bit crazy um uh, I, I often look at returns before they're filed as i'm preparing them in terms of the audit potential 
Mm-hmm. And you know, when I said a moment ago about high, my highest income taxpayers often are not the ones getting the audits, it's the people in the, the normal income ranges that are getting hit, uh, because it's easier for IRS. Over 75% of audits are done by automated process with IRS, the correspondence exams or the, the document matching. And that's something that you, you protect your clients, you keep them out of that by making sure that you ask the questions, get all the documents, and if there's one that was there last year and not this year, you ask why, where did it go, what did it become? Because those are easy ones, easy targets to watch for. And knowing in advance what kind of key areas a correspondence exam looks like tells you in advance where you need to ask the most questions. Well, we know that uh, it's going to be a year or so before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act really materializes in terms of of an audit uh, category changes. But for the returns that IRS is auditing right now, we always had to focus on Schedule A miscellaneous deductions. Oh, yeah. those employee business expenses, portfolio management expenses, even charitable contributions were hit. And the state and local taxes. <laughs> I've had IRS ask about state and local tax deduction when the only check was the one check they wrote to the state of California for 200000 that was easily verified, you know, because there was one check. They hadn't paid their quarterlies. So, so being able to know in advance where to watch. And I've got one that I'm going to warn people about for this coming year. There's some practitioners out there who think they want to take advantage of that uh, 199 cap A deduction. And people who have, who have in the last year tried to switch themselves from being employees to contractors or say that they are really statutory employees because they're out of pocket a lot of, of expense that would have gone on Schedule A and they still want to take that deduction. I would be extremely careful in looking at those because 99% of the time it's not going to fly. And, and you don't want to participate just because the client is telling you that this is what they heard they could do. No, and, um, you know, it's the 199A is one thing, but, you know, you start messing with the status of your, your or at least when you start playing with that, you open up the issue of their status. And um, all you need is a State Department of Labor or even Federal Department of Labor auditor to take a look at this and say, wait a minute, is this now an admission? Oh, gee. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you know, I mean, I yeah. have to think defensively from a criminal perspective. Right. Um, you know, di- you know, did they just admit that they had misclassified for all those years running up to now and only now because of the 199A, now suddenly the person's an employee. Um, the other side of it. That's the other picture on it. Yep. Yeah. Um, Interesting. You know, so, uh for this coming filing season, and, and you know, we're, actually, before we get to the my final question, um, Claudia, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, preferably not before April fifteenth, but if anybody does want to get a hold of you, um, what's the best? How's the best way to connect with you? Email's probably best. Just Claudia at taxmam dot com. T a x m a m. I when I will put that down in the description if you want to get a hold of Claudia. Uh, if you are somebody who loves to write. Uh, Claudia oh, yes. would probably love to talk to you about the Journal of Practice and Procedure, where yeah. she's always looking for people who enjoy writing, who would like to contribute. Um, and so with that final question, what kind of, uh, if, you, if you wanted to give people some, some last minute advice, uh, practitioners for this tax season, what do you think the number one thing that they should be thinking of? Because of the major law change, you're going to need to st- Take some time out with the staff, nobody else, and just think to yourselves, how is this going to affect our practices? Well, one of the things I'm sure it's going to do is it's going to take longer to do the tax returns because people are going to have questions. You're going to have more people with balanced dues. And because the major change to the structure of the return, where we have a base return with six schedules, Uh, that didn't exist previously, but all the forms that we had previously still exist. And the the less usage of the Schedule A, I know that for me, I'm going to spend some time this week redoing my fee schedule so that the fee reflects uh, the fact that there is taking more time and probably build some base fees that are a little higher to make up for the fewer Schedule A's that I'll be doing this year. So take some time to just 
sit down with your staff, talk about the ethics, the procedures of getting the returns done, the information to be claimed, uh, retained for you from what the client gave you, and the additional ways you're going to change your fee schedule so that your income doesn't go down this filing season. Yeah, no, great advice. Uh, and so listen, Claudia, thank you for taking time away on today. I appreciate yep. it. Um, and for everyone listening, I will put the um, Claudia's email address down below. Uh, so listen, Claudia, thank you. I will see you, I know, in May in Washington, yes. D.C. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm, I will probably be emailing you and, and texting you to pick your brain on problems in between <laughs> now and then. But good luck with tax season. And everyone listening, thank you for listening in. And uh, keep building your practices. And uh, you'll check out the, uh, next week's podcast when we post it next week. But thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's podcast. If you're interested in building your tax resolution practice, if you're interested in getting into this area, there's been no better time to do it. Go to taxrepllc.com. Check us out. If you want to join in, we are doing a special offer for to that kickoff 2019 properly. Use the code TAXREPGO, all caps, T-A-X-R-E-P-G-O, no spaces. That will get you $100 off for the first six months, get you started, get you making money, really start building your resolution practice, all right? So thank you all. Keep being excellent. Keep building your practices. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.